Welcome friend. Watch as step by step we attempt to remove and replace this complete Volkswagen engine. Let's dive straight in. First thing to do is set the scene, get it jacked up and on axle stands, take the front wheels off and then remove any plastics like the wheel arch, the engine cover and the tray if it's got one of those. Unscrewing a number of Torx head screws along the bottom edge and a few on top will remove the bump and then you just need to unclip that temperature sensor and then the bumper's free. Now, if you watched the previous video on the diagnosis of this engine, you'll know we've got a bit of a head start here in that we've already drained the fluids and done a few other bits of dismantling, which I'm guessing most people will have if they've decided they need to change their engine. But just for completeness, I'm going to try and show those steps here. I'm also going to show it in the order I would do it now rather than the order I did do it then. What we're working towards here is removing the big front cross member that the intercooler and radiator mount to. I was surprised how easy it was to do this and how much access you get to the engine once that's removed. It makes everything else a lot easier. So to that end there's two pipes going to the intercooler, one down the bottom and one on top and they're both getting removed and then there's two pipes that go to the radiator that also need removing. So I kind of wasted my time removing the radiator and intercooler before taking off this cross member and I think you can take them all off in one go and that way you get much better access at the alternator and things like that. I'm doing it the hard way here by removing the alternator first. I'm just marking the direction the belt goes. It's quite important it goes back in in the same orientation. The alternator just unbolts and wiggles out quite easily once it's out the way then the radiator and intercooler assembly can be removed but like I say and real mechanics step in and correct me if I'm wrong here I think it's easier if you just leave them attached to the cross member and pull it all out in one go. The only downside I can see with that is that the front cross member will be a bit heavier with all the radiator and things still attached but you won't have to remove the fan and the radiator and so on. Let's plow on with this then. Once you've disconnected the headlights, the bonnet catch, and in my case the horn, there's not much else to do apart from remove the four structural bolts on either side of this cross member. It's a good idea to leave at least one in till the last minute on either side so you can kind of controlledly remove the whole assembly. Apart from that there's just two little plastic trim type bolts on either side and then you're basically ready to try and carefully lift this out. Although it is a touch against my nature with a job like this it's quite important to be organised with bolts and other parts and put them in labelled bags and so on or in this case I'm just screwing them back in where they came from. Manual tells you to replace these little clips, though that does seem ridiculous because there's nothing wrong with them. Just to note here that I used the Haynes manual and I referred to the VW official one. It's kind of nice to refer to two different ones. The problem with the VW one is that it refers to all kinds of specialist tools that basically no one has apart from a VW garage. Anyway, hopefully that's where this step-by-step -step video will come in handy for you guys. I barely know what I'm doing, so I wouldn't rely on it exclusively, but it's probably nice to see some of the things actually happening rather than just written down. And here I'm just removing the gear change mechanism. So those two cables go all the way to the gear stick in the cockpit and essentially control the manual transmission. After you've undone those clips and slid off the eyelets, it's only three little bolts holding down the mounting bracket. Then we can remove the slave cylinder from the clutch, or in my case I knew I needed to bleed the clutch anyway, so I'm just using the quick release thing and taking the hose off. It's about at this point that it's time to remove the wiring loom and I was lucky in that the new to me engine had all the wiring still attached so it's mainly just at the ECU and this kind of area that I needed to remove the wires. It's probably a good idea to leave a proverbial breadcrumb trail and hope that the oil soaked crumbs are there when you get back to them. There's one connector underneath not to forget about. 
goes all the way through to there by the looks. It's almost surprisingly easy to remove the starter motor. It's really cool to see some of these things in detail, particularly this, a really compact, solid, reliable unit you just rely on every time you start the engine. Just got the two heater core pipes, which are proving to be very awkward back here. Let's give them another go. Yes. <sighs> I think we're getting there with this. The whole of the front's gone so we can wheel it out. The coolant hoses are off. The wiring's all been disconnected. The turbo is disconnected from the exhaust. I think we're ready oh the drive shaft so we've got to do the drive shaft so that'll be the last thing and then hopefully we can get this bad boy out and put a new one in what? Hey. that wasn't easy the shafts are held in place by a number of spline headed bolts and they're very tight and we can counter hold the shaft with a screwdriver or something similar in the vents of the disc brake. There is the drive shaft. I've just tied it up with that little wire hanger there. With those babies detached and held out of the way we can start thinking about taking some weight off the engine mounts. So I've had and used an engine hoist for many years for all kinds of workshop moving around and rejiggery but I've never actually lifted an engine with it so this is quite exciting. Trick here is to jack it up enough to just take weight off and then start at the bottom removing that mount before the other two on top that way you're not anywhere near the underside of the engine when you're undoing this thing. Very strong breaker bar and a good set of sockets is very useful for a task like this. I crack all the bolts loose with it before using the impact wrench on them. Now the key here is to do everything slowly and to leave the bolts in to the last minute till everything's perfectly set. You can use a ratchet strap, it's really useful for like tweaking the alignment of the engine. With that whole engine out, that's a bit of a milestone, so it's time for a cup of tea, a pat on the back, and to consider how we remove the transmission, switch that over, and the next steps. The transmission's actually really huge. With the engine out of the way, I was able to see bits of the bay that I'd never seen before, and they were very grubby. This is after quite a lot of cleaning. It was years ago but I do remember replacing the clutch on this car and removing the transmission with the engine still in the bay and I remember getting up the bolts and so on was really quite tricky and this is much easier. So as far as I'm aware I've removed all the bolts from this. Let's see what happens when we give it a little tug. Mm -hmm. goes. Okay, wow that was easier than expected. It's got a good amount of clutch dust in it. Great cleaner rags. This bearing just kind of pops out. I'm making alignment marks just so that the clutch can all go back in the same orientation if we decide to use it. I'm fairly sure the dual mass flywheel is either gone or on the way out so we'll have a little look at that as well and we can compare it to the one on the new second hand engine. Oh that looks good. Not too bad. As it turned out, the dual mass flywheel was so far gone it wouldn't move at all and the holes didn't align with the bolts so I couldn't even remove it from the old engine. As we're down on this nice clean bit of cardboard I thought we could have a quick talk about the clutches. This one here is from the new engine and you can see the wear plate, there's not a lot of material left. It's not down to the rivets here yet but it's not fantastic you can see places like here where it's starting to be worn past the lines yeah in general i think this would probably be just fine let's compare it to the one 
from the engine. I remember replacing this one around 60,000 miles and it's got more wear material convincingly. Uh, the rivet holes are a little bit deeper. The wear plate, it's got a good bit of material left on it. You can see the date of them all stamped in here. So this was the sixth month of 2011. In contrast, here's the original one that was replaced in the van. Uh, and this one failed and you can see the material just came off completely. So that was like a complete fail and there's a big crack down there. Okay, I've got the clutch and gearbox all assembled and talked up to specifications. I've just been cleaning the <laughs> I've just been cleaning the inlet manifold and ERG valve. They are all a lot cleaner. They were very grubby to begin with. Uh, so I'll bolt them back on while it's much easier to access the back of the engine and then we can shove this new beast in the van. If you watched the last video where I diagnosed the engine, you'll know I was scrabbling around in the engine bay doing all this kind of thing and it's really much easier with access to the back of the engine. I can even do time consuming things like tighten bolts up to the specified torque settings. I already had a look inside the valve cover and the camshaft and so on all look in really good condition. The ERG valve and inlet manifold did need quite a bit of cleaning so I'd definitely say it's worth taking them off in any TDI engines that are second hand just to give them a good clean before fitting it's so much easier with the engine off. Another super important thing to consider before putting back in is the timing belt because that's another thing that would be much easier to change while it's off. In my case I, I ummed and ahed about it for a good long while and decided it was in such good condition that I didn't really need to. This trusty van is old enough to have reached banganomical status now and £100 extra for a timing belt kit didn't seem to make sense. Okay, well, we've reached the point where the manual says follow the steps in reverse order to fit the engine. We're in there! And in terms of actually fitting the main mass of the engine in, it kind of is just doing that. The main difference for me is primarily getting all the torque settings right. I expect some old hands will argue that's not necessary and have inbuilt torque sensors but I just don't have the experience to know how tight to make them and a few of them genuinely surprised me. Before reassembling the gear change mechanism like I am now I bled the clutch and you do that in reverse just by pumping hydraulic fluid into that nipple you see there and it, with a big syringe or something like that and it goes up into the reservoir and that seems to be the easiest way to get all the air out. Got the exhaust connected to the turbo it's quite fiddly because it's right back there it just connects with one of these clamps that clamps two sort of flanges together. There's just two more bolts to put the exhaust onto the engine mount and then we'll be on to something else. The starter motor's going back just the way it came in but with a torque wrench to finish off the bolts. Incidentally I'm getting the torque specifications for all these from the manual. I'm not listing them here just because I expect every variant of an engine will be slightly different whereas these general steps could sort of apply to almost any engine. Same deal with the alternator here, and the belt has to go back in the right way around, remember. Then we're just hooking up this wiring loom to the ECU, and we've got these little vacuum hoses to fiddle about with. You can see I've reattached the fuel lines to the tandem pump. The battery tray and battery are going back in. I'm trying to do everything I can think of that requires access to the engine before I put this front cross member back on. And with that in place, I can fit the radiator, and attach all the coolant hoses back up. And then finally, we're getting perilously close. I think it's time to put the fluids back in. I think we're ready to go. I'm going to add the air box. This is... Uh, I can't tell you how exciting this is after putting all this new engine in the first try of it. So first time, I'm going to leave the wiring loom for the injectors off so that the engine can just turn over via the starter motor a bit before firing up. Make sure oil's everywhere. We've got a small coolant leak back here, which I just noticed as I started filling the coolant up which is uh, quite annoying because it's right back there 
but it's very small so I'm still going to try it anyway. <laughs> Let's try it and see what happens. This is it. And upon startup, you can see a little rag falling down and that coolant leak that I was talking about. It's the hose it's leaking from. It's going to be quite awkward to get to. <laughs> we must be getting somewhere with putting the wheels on. This is so exciting to try out. When we initially broke down in the van to add insult to injury, my wife opened the door and it nearly got torn off in the wind. So I had that to fiddle around with. Okay, first trip down the lane, no explosions. I'm going to call that a success. Uh, my senses are mega attuned to any tick-tocks from the engine and unfortunately I just don't have the experience to know what they really mean and I sort of think it's probably just normal. So yeah, more testing and we'll get the computer hooked up and see if there's any faults. So I'm using VCDS by Rostec to interface with the ECU. It seems to be the most popular method and there's lots of support online. Just doing an auto scan. It's come up with a few red things, so we'll see. Looking through the log, I'm pretty chuffed. There's only seems to be one error with the engine and that is a glow plug on cylinder four here. That's not a big deal, I don't think. There's a few other errors to do with low battery voltage and it being disconnected. I'll just reset them, that's not a problem. It's been a while since we changed the engine and we've had to make a few long journeys in the van so we've been very thankful for that. There's a ton more stuff that I wanted to talk to you about to do with burning vegetable oil, changing the lift pump, logging fuel temperature against oil temperature and coolant temperature and seeing how that affects the duration of injection which we can do with ECDS. That's probably enough for one video though, a complete engine change. So I hope you got something out of that. If you did, consider subscribing, get in touch in the comments below. Apart from that, peace and love. See you in the next video.